what was the question? Why, how's the Mac changed my life? Not fast enough. It's kept me isolated, kept me from having a wife. It's kept me from having a life. How has it changed my life? I'm just obsessed with good Macs. It's always best on a Mac. <laughs> Everything is best on a Mac. Are you kidding? Um, wow. I, first of all, I've never knowingly slept with a Windows user. Ever. Ever. That would never, ever happen. Uh, not knowingly. Sex with a Windows user is like, oh no, baby, baby, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good this time. No, really, I won't crash. I promise. You're just sitting there in the bed going, mm-hmm, sure. There are basically two groups of computer users. There are the Apple people and the Apple wannabes. Oh my gosh. I've, I've seen a lot of arguments. I've been in a lot of arguments of like Mac versus PC. And I'm obviously very biased, but I've always <laughs> noticed the Mac people make good constructive points about like the interface and the design of the computers and how much better and easier it is to use. And then always the PC people are just like, yeah, well, Macs suck. Macs <laughs> are terrible. Like, why are you? Macs are pathetic. We get to fight against Linux people who are just as arrogant as we used to be eight years ago. It's just like when you see, when you see the kid, your, your kid take the car out and you say, I, under, I understand you're going to have to make your own mistakes someday, son, but someday you'll be as experienced as I am and you'll understand exactly what life as an adult is like. If you can open up every application without anything freezing, when are you ever going to pull yourself away from the computer? With, with a Windows computer, every so often it doesn't work anymore. And that gives you a chance to engage yourself in the life outside, even if for a few moments while the thing <laughs> reboots. The few, the few minutes while it reboots, you're just sitting there mad at it. And you're like, yo, well, I got to get you. this out. That's you, angry boy. When my <laughs> computer reboots, I get a sandwich. I embrace life. I make a phone call. I look out the window and think, someday I'll go outside. Michigan, baby. Boston. Yeah. New York. Hey, Davenport, Iowa. The OC. Oregon. Los Angeles. Texas. London. Japan. Denmark. New Zealand. Yeah. Canada. Sweden. Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, Australia. Macworld 2007. Give me a yes! 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 yes. Here we go. I'm wearing an outfit I do wear a couple of times when I've come to Macworld. My homage to Steve Jobs and my belt buckle also thanking him for all the work he's done for the Macintosh community. And my utilities, which is just something that I happen to like to wear when I come to Macworld. Well, every year we come earlier and earlier trying to get somewhere, you know, a little bit better seating. It's great. It's like Broadway. What time did you get here? Four o'clock. Because she uh -oh. made me. <laughs> Her birthday's in March. I said, you know, if we go uh, in January, if we go two months early, Mommy can go to the Macworld Expo. We got here last night at 9 p.m. It was definitely on one of my life's things to get done. I am a Mac head. <laughs> Thank 
you for coming. So thank you. We're going to make some history together today. So, welcome to Macworld. We are picking up lots and lots of new members of the Mac family, and we couldn't be happier. As a matter of fact, uh, here's uh, uh, one that might be coming on soon. Jim Olchin at Microsoft was quoted recently as saying if he didn't work for Microsoft, he would buy a Mac, and he's retiring soon, so I've alerted our Seattle stores to keep an eye out for him and give him really good service. Today, we've added to the Mac and the iPod, we've added Apple TV, and now iPhone. And you know, the Mac is the only one that you really think of as a computer, right? And so we thought about this and we thought, you know, maybe our name should reflect this a little bit more than it does. So we're announcing today, we're dropping the computer from our name, and from this day forward, we're going to be known as Apple Incorporated to reflect the product mix that we have today. Only Steve knows. Steve knows what we want, and uh, we agree with him. He knows what people really need before they know they need it. It's always been like a dream to come here to a, to a keynote, see Steve live. It's just him. It's... He is Apple. This is Steve. How many years in a row? Steve. Hey, hey Jay! Oh, so good to see you. It's a reunion on Mac. If you if you go online and look up the definition of a cult, Mac users are a cult. You know, complete fealty to one leader. <laughs> but it's a fun cult. It's not one of those bad cults. <laughs> I get so much hate mail when I say that, but in a way it's kind of true. Cults necessarily aren't bad. It just means that it's a small, fanatical group of people. And Mac users are small and fanatical. <laughs> Welcome to the Digi Barn here on the farm. We're going to talk about the Macintosh computer and how it makes all things possible. Here is where I make my music. This is where I write my opera. Where is this? for me as a musician. The Mac makes me feel like I'm alive. I see those billboards and I say, right, you're gonna make that possible. You understand that, you people, and I wanna support you by buying that computer. My husband, Bruce Damer, makes clothes under his own label called Cyberwares. He actually makes his clothes right here in the bus. Computing is becoming part of yourself, it's becoming part of your clothing. So I chose to, to take up this, this challenge of making garments. I can turn on my iPod right here and I can run it right through here. I've got this little shuffle here. I might, uh, here's, oh, here's a nano here. It's a Renaissance doublet that you'd see in, say, Shakespeare, but it's for your wares. People came up to me all up throughout Macworld asking how they could get it. I bought this place 10 years ago, and what does a nerd do when they buy a farm and they have a barn? Well, we raise pigs, but you fill it with old computers, of course. Welcome to the Digibarn. Uh, 
I call this project a memory palace for nerds. And why is that? Well, when nerds come, they walk through the barn and they see a computer that they grew up with and suddenly all these stories pour out of them. Let's take a look at some of the machines that came before the Mac. And particularly, let's take a look at this guy. This is the Altair 8800, and it's a big metal box. These boards, you had to sort of solder them together yourself. So this is definitely not a user-friendly machine. This is the IBM PC, it was launched in 1981 by IBM and it's your office computer. This also didn't give people very much of a warm, fuzzy feeling. Jump forward into the future, into 1984, and here's another machine called the Macintosh. It's the machine for creative people. It was just a little more than a year ago that a Macintosh was still something you gave to your teacher. But today there are hundreds of thousands of Macintosh computer owners. Is the Macintosh the computer for the rest of us? And who are the rest of us? It's more sophisticated, yet less complicated. It's more powerful, yet less cumbersome. It can store vast amounts of yesterday. Macintosh, the computer for the rest of us. The whole point of the machine was to make it not only extremely powerful and useful, but also extremely easy to use. 1981 was the genesis year of the Mac project really getting funded, and that's when I joined the project. I'm Daniel Kotke. I was fortunate to have been a friend of Steve Jobs in college, and that's how I got to be the first employee at Apple. Apple quickly got into the fun aspect of technology, and one of the core things about the Mac was graphics, and what you see is what you get. That was the big revolution. The idea came up that we all wanted a computer that you could take to bed with you. In the short history of personal computing, there has never been such a dazzling campaign. In less than a year, the Macintosh was transformed into an instant myth using pictures instead of words. In the early days, uh, the only people who were using personal computers were hobbyists. They, they had to build them themselves. Apple was uh, one of the first companies to actually build a, a prepackaged product. There was a, a sense of, sort of techno-utopia. People were getting together, they were going to change the world through technology. The Macintosh was the anti-IBM, the anti-the man, the big brother. And the kind of people who were attracted to that, you know, to making their own computers, were the kind of people who wanted to change the world. That's the great part of working on a revolution, right? You think you're changing the world. And I think we did change the world. We believed in one person, one computer, controlling his or her own destiny. We positioned IBM as one big company who wanted to control the destiny of everyone. We really believe that this computer, because it was easier to use and still powerful, it would enable a whole different class of people to use computers. We also talked about how society was going to be revamped. I wanted to use my skills as a computer designer to help the world get to this new, better place. And, and these were kind of crazy dreams a little bit, yeah. but boy, did they did they drive us on. I wanted to be a part of that. That's, that was my real reason for building this computer. We had to do it. We had to start Apple. Apple always considered itself a revolutionary force fighting a battle against the empire. It was the force that was fighting against the, the beige banality of the IBM PC and the office computer. The whole idea of creating the future really became clear to me that this was something that uh, that we could do here. Well, you know, it came out that little box back in 84. Uh, it was a big sensation. And everyone's saying, like, man, the Mac. And this, this thing is like made by stoners for stoners. You know, you can't be a part of Apple. You can't be involved in Apple. You can't be constantly paying attention to Apple without absorbing a great deal of what they profess, what they profess to be their basic strategy, their basic uh, philosophy. The people at Apple themselves were very non-traditional. These people put out their own advertising campaign for their own product, and the people who resonated with it were the ones who got involved. The 
Macintosh community had really grown up around this concept of being different. That, you know, the IBM PC and then later on Microsoft Windows was what everyone else did. And so Mac users, we banded together because there weren't very many of us. It was more like a survival mechanism, like those penguins were hauled together. You got to press tightly together and, and exclude all outsiders to share whatever body warmth uh, you, can, you can manage. Mac community had this idea that they were using something special. You ended up with this movement, a, a really a, a social movement around the computer. The Mac came not just with a machine in a box, it came with a whole community. We were tremendously excited about discovering together this extraordinary tool, this, this collaborative tool that would let us do what had been in our dreams for years. Creative community, audio, video, graphics, those people use Macs because it's the overall vision. Computers were for numbers and for databases and, you know, kind of accounting things. And so suddenly this whole creative community was brought to computers and really with the Macintosh just adopted it instantly and to this day really, really uses it. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I have a BA in advertising. Right now we're looking at uh, my Mac Museum. You know, each computer, each piece has a, its own story. That's part of the reason that I kept and I didn't sell any of my systems. Everybody that will work with us, you know, ad agencies, designers, everybody's on the Mac and they appreciate like the museum that we put together. So they spend more time looking at the computer instead of uh, bugging me and telling me what to do. My name is Michael Eldred, but everybody calls me Count, and I'm a producer and engineer of music and make noises. I work with DJ Shadow on remixes with Radiohead, Velvet Underground, Frank Sinatra. I was all about learning the Mac because after about two seconds of looking through the manual, I was like, this makes perfect sense. And all the other stuff didn't make sense to me. I mean, only Mac people really put stickers all over their laptops. And I think it's indicative that this is kind of something that's close to me, like my clothing, and it's an identification. It really took the computer away from just being a business application to being something that was personal and was mine. You explain to them that it makes more sense to buy a new computer, but some people are just very attached to, to what they have. We actually call it triage because we're, you know, we're trying to, can we fix it right now or we have to keep it? Is it worth fixing? So yeah, it is, I think more like a vet's office because it's the way people hold their computers. The great thing about the Mac is that you can completely customize it to the types of uses that you want and it sort of like colors your worldview in a way or it's like, okay, I can self-individuate my computer experience in a way that has meaning to me. If you want to call it technology, I mean, the people who first invented metal swords had a great reverence for their artifacts, right? Any kind of tool that man has ever made that is useful and integral to your life, you're going to have a connection to it. So I just think the Mac falls into that category. No one's fallen in love with their Taurus, right? There's not Taurus user groups, oh my god, we love Taurus. People have come to consider a Macintosh as an extension of themselves. That's just the way it is. I mean, that's what a cult product does. We all want, want something to believe in, you know? Whether it's a, a religion, a, a country, it happens to be a company in, in this respect. People want to believe in Apple, the company. They think that Steve Jobs is their best friend, that he's making stuff personally for them. I think it's the beauty of Apple, is that they can make products that you immediately fall in love with, and therefore, you, by extension, you fall in love with the company. And you think the company's making those products just for you, you know? And that's great, but don't, don't extrapolate that into uh, the actual corporate American company.
I get more excited about at Expo than anything else in my life. I like doing this. I love coffee. I love my kids. I love my wife. I like my house. I like my camera. I just am just fascinated by Apple technology. It's a blast, blast, blast. It used to be that Expo was where you learned about everything that came out. So whatever it was, you wanted to see it, touch it, and see the specs. And there was no internet, so you had one chance a year. And we all went, and we all went as many, as many times as we could, because that's where you got involved. A Macintosh trade show is unlike any other computer conference. In fact, it's more like a love fest than a trade show with adoring Mac users eager to gobble up the latest Macintosh products and applications. I always say that uh, uh, Muslims go to, go to Mecca, we come to Mecca. The Mac crowd itself is one of the most diverse crowds I've ever seen. And going to the Mac conference, it's like every color, every stripe, every sexual orientation. You know, suddenly it's just like, whoa, here's this huge slice of all these different types of lifestyles, you know? <laughs> Mac users back then, there were just a, you know, a few of us seeking each other out, supporting each other. Uh, there was not a lot of software. You, know, you would go out and buy something because it was all there was to buy. Reese Jones helped uh, get it going. He was the first one down the computer store to say, hey, let's get a Mac user group going. Joining us in the studio now is Rains Cohen, sysop of the BMUG Bulletin Board. BMUG stands for Berkeley Mac Users Group. Okay. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about BMUG. What do you, what do, you do there? Well, we started as a UC Berkeley student group, University of California at Berkeley, and we now are about 6,000 members around the world. And how do you as a users group see Shareware? I mean, what's the point? Well, we are an educational nonprofit organization, and we're in, sort of in the business of giving away information. We try to build a culture of sharing. Uh, the, the motto of BMUG was, we're in the business of giving away information. BMUG met every week on the Berkeley campus. It was really up to us to, to, to support each other, take care of each other, and we built systems to do that, publishing a newsletter twice a year. People started getting together to bring the latest information, tips, techniques. It was you know, a small core of Mac users compared to a larger field of computer users overall. So it was all about helping each other make the most of our computers. Mac user groups are a way of getting involved in the community on a personal level, as opposed to the internet, which is kind of interpersonal. I can't see your face, I can't hear your voice. They used to be a great resource for software. Uh, there was, they, a lot of them would give out floppy disks back in the day. And it was a way to go once a month and talk to people and get them to talk to you about your Macintosh. The heyday of the user groups was basically when I was in high school. The East Coast had the Boston Computer Society Mac user group. The West Coast had the Berkeley Macintosh users group. Of course, there was lack of internet, lack of message boards. You'd have to go to a meeting, and then someone will say, well, actually, I was doing a bus ad the other day, and there's a $400 program, but there's a $10 trick you can do instead. And, and you're saying, tell me about that $10 trick. They were like uh, the internet these days. They used to do a lot of swapping uh, software. They used to bring floppy disks, and they would like illegally trade uh, software with each other by popping it in and out of their computers. We were the largest users group in the United States, probably in the world, actually. It was all a volunteer group, and there were like nine or 10 of us who would donate, you know, 20 or 30 hours a week. The BMUG group also was very instrumental because we traveled to all the major Apple Mac worlds. There was Mac World San Francisco, there was Mac World Boston, there was Mac World Tokyo, there was Mac World Paris, and we would go there and we would help people set up their own users group within the community of that area. So we were really a central clearinghouse of uh, information about the Mac. My earliest memory of the Mac community is when I was really little. Like, I think I was young as maybe three. And I remember every Tuesday night, my dad would go out and it would be meeting night. I had no idea what meeting night is, but now I know it was a Mac user group. We've had meetings you know, every week for more than a decade, and people would traditionally go out to dinner after the meeting. This is the 20th annual Netter's Dinner. A lot of the people who come here have been doing Macintosh from the days of old. And when I say the days of old, I'm talking very, very old folks. In what year did you start using the Macintosh? 2007, anyone? 88. 
87. 84. There we go. How many people have uh, three or more? Eight, nine, ten. This is your house, right, Chuck? <laughs> right, Chuck. <laughs> Any Mac 128s that are working? Eileen! Eileen uh, needs something for a 128k working Mac. I, I will not accept a gift. Well, the problem was that it was a computer that was not widely adopted. Computers were still very mysterious, very different, and people all needed to learn how to use them. The Mac community made it into a much bigger thing. It wasn't just you go to a mo uh, meeting and talk about computers, but people were also talking about what they were doing with those computers. I love coming to the meetings. I like the pizza. I, I like the camaraderie that we have here. You get free pizza at the meetings, and we do a lot of fun things, such as talk about our computers. It's the place to be. This year's Macworld Expo has the usual displays of faster hardware, spiffy software, thousands of adoring Macintosh fans, but the big issue at this Macworld is not the hardware or the software, but the company itself. And the question everyone is asking is how will Apple recover from what has unquestionably been a terrible year? People are asking me, I heard Apple's going out of business, I heard that the Mac's not going to be here anymore, should we still be buying Macintosh? And there's a lot of people out there saying, oh, the Mac is dead, are you crazy? Face up to reality, Apple is dead. And we're not afraid to say, we love the Mac and we think PCs and Windows suck. People have been talking about the demise of Apple for the longest time, but this never really happens. And as we know, that's still 25 million really fiercely loyal uh, customers. You gotta be an optimist to be a Mac user, because there were those hard times. There were times when we thought maybe, you know, maybe I'll have to use a Windows system. Maybe there won't be a Mac in a couple of years. It was kind of tough. Yeah, there was a, a, a short period where I thought, gee, this could happen. I could have to use a PC. I, I didn't worry a lot about it. I knew it was possible. The mid-90s was such a frustrating time because we knew, as Mac users, that Apple wasn't going away and that it couldn't go away. We would have entered the dark ages if Apple went away. We couldn't let that happen. It drove me crazy. In the early 90s, I met Bruce Damer, an expert in so-called avatar virtual worlds, fell in love, married him, and defected to the PC. When we first met, uh, I had kind of given up on the Mac. And the Mac just wasn't evolving, and you couldn't run a lot of programs on the Mac. So I said, no, we can't have a Mac. We can't run all the new stuff on it. And it got all cranky, and uh, she was, she was kind of sad about that. So for 10 lonely years, I was a PC person only. I forsook the Mac. We're transitioning from a dialogue that has centered on survival, and we went out and we raised some money, uh, and no one asks me yet uh, anymore whether we have enough cash to get by. The time Apple was supposed to die, the cult was dying, et cetera, et cetera. So they brought me in basically to preserve the cult. Guy Kawasaki, uh, for those folks who don't know, was the, he literally, on his business cards, he was the chief evangelist for Apple. Um, evangelism started as uh, a way to get the news out about the Mac to people who had never seen it before, and it was all developers, it was before it released. And there you were really taking the message of, you don't understand how big this is, how big it's going to be. Um, and then Guy Kawasaki came back and did a much more user-focused evangelism. And it was much more about rallying the troops and getting them involved and having them go tell the press why they were wrong about whether Apple was or wasn't going to die. Evangelism comes from the Greek word of bringing the good news, so an evangelist believes he or she is bringing good news to other people. And uh, that's what we were doing, bringing the good news of Macintosh. The company realized that it was their customers that were going to save them, and they had all these passionate people, and how do I connect with them? The best way to connect with them is with another person. And Guy went out and connected with individuals. I created an email list called The Evangelist, and that had a good 45,000 subscribers. When The Evangelist 
found or when I found people in the press who I thought were inaccurate or unfair. I let 45,000 of my closest friends know. In my opinion, it actually was counterproductive because it got a lot of individuals focused negatively on the press. It became a gang squad where they would, someone would print something, whether it was true or not, if it was negative of the apple, uh, it seemed like this evangelist went after them in a big way and, and sort of made some enemies in the end. Uh, the, the comparison I always, I always make is like Tony, Tony Montana from Scarface. They're spraying the walls, their machine gun, pop, 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 and you're like, honey, sweet, sweetie, it's okay to have other computers that work in many ways, just as well as the one that you're using. It doesn't diminish your experience at all. It was a wonderful way to keep the community together while it, when it was really feeling like it was falling apart. Apple had a bunch of bad CEOs and a bunch of bad products, but they had this wonderful community. Well, they're just, you know, they bleed six colors. Well, maybe not six colors anymore because the logo's not six colors anymore, but at the time they were bleeding six colors. Uh, it, it really was a religion, and it was a feeling of zealousness that, uh, transcends <laughs> rationality, actually. Well, they were about to start putting the nails into the coffin and bury Apple and the Macintosh, but a funny thing happened on the way to the funeral. Steve Jobs showed up, and suddenly there is new energy, new direction, new black ink, and a stunning new product, the iMac. It's, it's been a great year, and uh, we're not quite, quite done with our fiscal year yet, but we've had three quarters, and we've managed to go from losing a billion dollars the year before to uh, actually making over $200 million during the first uh, three quarters. All of a sudden, the Mac platform's revitalized. I mean, there's a lot of reason now uh, to choose Macintosh over Windows or Win95. Apple's bigger than McDonald's. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> you know, we're already the, the David, but I think we, you know, we will overcome the Goliath at some point. Steve Jobs' report on the company's improved fiscal health was no doubt welcome news to Macintosh fans. I thought the world's going to work out better than that, and it has. It's, it's worked out fine. We know what we've got because we can see the alternative. If Macintosh has disappeared, I don't think I'd be as happy, you know? It wouldn't be the same. It was on the brink of the grave, and we can all be grateful to Steve Jobs for resurrecting Apple as a viable company. If you were to ask me what my three major influences were, they've got to be, you know, my dad, John Lennon, uh, and Steve Jobs. He's the best. He, he, he is the Tom Hanks of CEOs. I'm willing to follow him. I think that whatever he says is, is fine with me. You're great, Steve. I'll always love you. And Steve said, let there be forgiveness for my people. My people have been down for too long. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Toward the end of the 90s, I started looking at the Mac. I knew that Steve Jobs had come back, and they started having life in them again. We're at Burning Man one year, and I had this vision pop in my head. Galen was right. To have fun in our lives, we've got to get a Mac. And I flipped. Every artist's door in me sprang open again. And I said to Bruce, that's it. We have to get Macs. It's time to go back. It's really true. I, I walked into that store and, and looked at the machine and started to shake. Then I realized I'm back with my community. I'm back with my friends. I'm back with all the other nutballs, <laughs> just like me. And it's been a long time since I've been there. I was homesick. I'd come home. Well, we're uh, here at Swig Bar in San Francisco and holding my annual um, Macworld party. We partied up to about five, or two, two in the morning, about five hours straight of, of mingling with Mac users. But I noticed how, how rich and vibrant the user community was online. I just imagine it's got to be 10 times better if you do it in person. As the Mac gets more popular and as things 
grow larger than uh, than just the core user group. The people that have been using it for 20 years are kind of starting to take a back seat to the people like myself that are growing up and switching from PC to Mac. People tend to not be as close niche as they were before. And even in the early 2000, 2001, the landscape has changed greatly. So what I decided to do back in 2003 is start planning events to remember who we are as Mac users. Now that Apple's more successful, the community's not quite as uh, cohesive as it used to be. Uh, they were sort of sticking together in bad times. Um, it's definitely changing. It's kind of a pick your poison. So you want a lot of camaraderie, then you got to be in a company that might die. Sometimes near-death experiences make you <laughs> have a better sense of camaraderie. It's probably true that there's less of a community. And the irony is, is that it's because Apple has been more successful. I would think that many people at Apple have a different attitude, that, that when you're that successful and you're that hot, I, I don't necessarily mean they're arrogant, but they certainly don't feel threatened. They are separate from that community. They are not responsible for it, nor are they caretakers of it. Sorry! They've made efforts to throw some goods out to people or to, you know, get some toys to the user groups in general, but it's really been little stuff. It's really been thanks, not let's go do something together. I don't think they've done very much together with user groups in years. Apple's a very secret company. It's a very private company. They do what they do, and when they're done, they tell you what, the, what you get. So it was this odd conflict at all times where the, the company would say, isn't this great? We'll help you use this. We'll make this happen. And the, and the user community would grab it and say, isn't this great? Why doesn't it do this? And there would be a conflict that would actually cause some amount of you know, anger among the two in some ways. It would be a very big conflict because the user groups were expecting more openness, and Apple was expecting more adoration and thanks, which is kind of a an odd way of having followers, isn't it? <laughs> so that community, I think, in some ways, um, pissed off Apple at times. Oh, Apple? They could care less at this point. Uh, why? Um, it's not important to them. The corporations today, their community is basically what they control on their website. Well, Apple's always had an interesting relationship with user groups. User groups had an element of unpredictability. It's been uh, close and far. I think the Mac community scares Apple to a certain degree because they don't know how to control these people. Apple's all about control now. And you really can't control the user group, although they are your frontline troops. It's almost as if Apple forgotten their own roots. You know how that happens? And I think it's sad. I don't think they do enough to support the groups anymore. Well, I think that's really interesting because I think it's a natural evolution. I think those who are early adopters in anything, once it becomes mainstream or more people start using it, they feel left out. They feel left behind. I think that's an inevitable thing that happens in evangelist communities or small communities, that sort of bridging the gap for when things go mainstream is a difficult transition. That's it. One of the big features on iMac, supposedly, Dave, is uh, an idiot, never used a computer for it, take it out of the box, 10 minutes, and you're up on the internet. Absolutely. How do you do that? The internet assistant, setup assistant comes up and asks you, do you want to start to get on the internet? Mm -hmm. You say, yes. It's amazing, though. I was here last year, and it, the web domination wasn't as obvious. This year, it's, it's just so much about the web. Well, there's been a change nationwide in user groups. People are not joining. Young people aren't joining because young people have now grown up with computers, and so it's, there's nothing mysterious for them to learn. And they don't realize that there are still experts in the groups that they can learn from. And I actually think the, the Macintosh market is aging. Hi, I attend VMUG. In fact, I wouldn't miss the question period for anything. Not only is there pizza and good camaraderie, but you actually hear real people. I would highly recommend anybody who is interested in purchasing a Macintosh to join the local VMAGs. There's a gap somehow, and that there's a younger group right now. 
the Mac community, because there's an older group that are very, very dedicated, grew up with the Mac, and we're all 40 and above. And then there's a kind of a jump, the 30-year-olds, 25-year-olds, and then they could get down to about 25 and under. You know, 45, 55-year-olds are going to want to come and meet in person and be part of a group. You know, at some point, as you go younger, you've got people who aren't going to want to come sit in a room together. They're used to doing online stuff. You know, and that was one of the things that we saw really changing with BMUG. Um, you know, it starts to lose its point. Uh, BMUG um, had a good uh, 10, 15 year run, and then this internet thing came along. And suddenly, publishing a book twice a year was no longer the most effective way of communicating with people. Eventually, uh, we were able to um, uh, do a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, got rid of the debt, got rid of the office, got rid of the staff. So there's definitely, I, I share the concern I've heard that there's, uh, with the internet, people get together, they go out, they find their answer, and then they don't come back. They don't build the lasting community connections. It'll be different. It won't look like what it used to look like. <laughs> By the day they shut the whole thing down, going when the internet killed us, I felt I was losing that sense of human contact because you're meeting people you would never have an opportunity to meet otherwise. When you go to Google to find an answer to a question, all you find out is the answer to that question. It's very difficult to get that sort of random connection, information that you had no idea existed but will change your life as soon as you hear about it. Okay, I'll say this. I think the community is bigger than ever, but it's in a different form because it's all online. There's so many community websites and there's so many blogs. Yeah, we watched the keynote speech online. And it was actually kind of funny because I was like, hey, you want to watch a movie? And you're like, no. Oh, keynote yeah. speech is on. Are you kidding me? I was, that was like, WWDC. I'm just like, oh, OK. So I was like watching TV. And I'd come over and be like, ooh, time machine. OK. <laughs> looking Go forward. Back. Looking forward actually, to time Leopard. machine looks amazing. That does look amazing. That looks so cool. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to Leopard. I'm, I'm excited, too. Yeah. Only I'm probably not going to get it but I'm gonna see it at your house. I'll, I'll lend you the CD. Okay. The funny thing, it, cause you just mentioned Mac community and I was like, what, what the hell is a Mac community? Like I never, like what? I mean, there's, there's kind of no need for a Mac community anymore. I, I think it'd be cool if there was one. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone, Getting it? This is one device. And we are calling it i5. The day Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Just take my finger. I've slowly seen more keynotes devoted to the iPod, more keynotes devoted to we have FM transmitters and Apple's making cases now, and it it is kind of troubling. I don't know the way to put it, but but it's 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 losing its face as a community and becoming more or less just a a brand. There's been some talk that uh, people are very disappointed because it's been all about the iPhone and all about Apple TV, and and there really wasn't any Mac stuff announced by Apple. Now, when you look at what Apple's done over the past uh, few years, 
they seem to be moving, not away from the Mac, but they seem to be moving in different areas. Yep. You folks have to realize that Apple works on a news cycle, and that's it. Move on. It might be very good for Apple, but as far as the Macintosh community, it's Apple in some ways pulling back from that community and doing something a little bit different that they're not really interested in informing a community around it. That's the kind of control Apple likes. It's so smooth and so seamless, but a little bit less of a soul in there. Um, it's in danger of becoming a big, uh, a big Microsoft-like company with a monopoly on a lot of people's technology. Uh, it could actually turn out to be quite the opposite of what a lot of the early, uh, of the early promise. It became a business, man. I mean, that's, it's nothing but business now. Changing the name from Apple Computer to Apple Inc. doesn't mean anything to Apple itself. It means something to those old school folks. Oh, Apple's gonna stop making computers. No, they're not. They make most of their money from computers, and all the devices hook up to computers. But there's a, that, that group of people out there that still think that, that Apple needs to keep that ethos. It's a company, guys. I always tell folks that Apple is just another company. It's just another big corporate American company. It's the community that you want to talk about, the community that's cool, that, that you love. Don't love Apple, love the community. I like it. Uh, I was uh, watching the movie just now, the Apple telephone, cell, cell phone, smart. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, iPhone. That's a nice one. I'm here, the first line for the new iPhone. How long have you been here? Five days, since Monday, 5 a.m. My voice is gone, I feel exhausted, just can't wait to be in my own bed. Are you an Apple fanatic? Um, I follow the iPods, yes, but I haven't, uh, I don't own a, an iPod, I don't own a Mac. What time did you guys get here? Uh, been here since like 9 o'clock this morning. Actually, I just met her here, but I came here with my brother. The only Apple product I own is, is an iPod. We were here during the rain last night. The rain again earlier today, the blazing hot sun. It's, it's crazy. Oh, I have an iPod, that's about it. It's pretty much self-explanatory. Hottest device, have yeah. to have it. <laughs> Another analogy comes to mind, but you know, once you go Apple, you don't go back. I'm here because somebody gave me $200 to sit and hang out. <laughs> So long. Thank you, buddy. I have a mobile. If I didn't have to make some phone calls between now and 6.30, I'd smash this on the floor in front of y'all. I don't even throw it on the fucking floor, whatever. Shit is garbage. This is what I've been waiting online for. For some nitwit enthusiast to hurl to the floor, but gently so it doesn't break, something far better than anything I have ever had, and that brings me ever so closer to that nirvana that is the overpriced world of Mac products. satellite trucks. I saw about a thousand, thousands of people. And I said, what the hell's going on? Is, is Paris Hilton in town? I mean, I mean, uh, it's like a media circus. People are giving away chairs. It's crazy. It's crazy. So I asked somebody, I said, what's going on? They said, oh, well, it's selling a phone. We want to buy a phone. I said, what? You want to buy a phone? I, I got one. I got one. See that? What you going to do with it? Uh, well, it's pretty heavy. I might use it as a doorstop. It's just a phone, guys. Come on. <laughs> uh, 
remember, it was eating an apple that caused us as a, as a race of people to be cast out of paradise. It's true. So maybe that same knowledge that was so evil early on in mankind's story remains evil. And each time we take a bite of this technological apple, we move further from the garden that was our home and deeper into the hell that is our current want. You're the second person that says something like that to me today on this line. Yo. So that's kind of crazy. I don't know, man. It's, yo, I don't know. Are we moving towards the bright light or the light? Or are we oh. moving towards faith? Are we moving away from it? Is it technology? Is this the devil? Is it God? What is, what's really going on? Who knows? He thinks you're crazy too. <laughs> this should have been shot in high def, and shame on you for not shooting this in high def. HDV. It's gonna look completely out of date. It's gonna it's not gonna look happening and current. You could have rented an HDV camera for a few hundred dollars. There's no excuse. Hi, guys. Let's go find God. Let's go find my gold iPod. Ooh, my gold iPod with my name on it. I was looking for a Mac head. And I was yeah, a very yeah. old school Mac head by then. When I first went into her bedroom, there was a Mac 2 sitting there right next to the bed. Unbelievable. It was exactly what I needed for my, you know, for my test. I had the computer. Yeah. She had the board. She had the slot. I had the board. <laughs> We got a Mac in August of 84 when my dad bought one, but we had Apple IIs before that. I remember looking through Byte magazine with my brother and drooling over the buildings, and that's where Apple is. That's where Apple is. You know, that mattered to us. My brother, Tim, is actually 12 years younger than me, so he started out on the Apple II that we had in the family. I think I inherited some of that, you know, the geeky side from my dad. Now you have a family full of Mac users. Yes, I do. Yes, they're all... They have to run on that. They'd be in trouble otherwise. So it's kind of that whole side has been handed down from generation to generation. My son Julian knows more at 14 about the Mac. He's introducing me to stuff. Macintosh. Definitely Macintosh. I have an iMac. I have, I don't know what it's called. Powerbook. Powerbook. G4. There we go. They rock.